I'm Professor Jenna Hartel. Welcome to Information Science. This 11th episode in the What Makes This Paper Great series features an article by Susan Lee Starr, The Ethnography of Infrastructure. Starr was a spectacularly interdisciplinary scholar, and her work is used across multiple social sciences. I am approaching her article through the lens of my own field, information science. From this perspective, the ethnography of infrastructure is likewise a call to the ethnographic study of information. My video, Profile Susan Lee Starr, describes the paper's publication context, analyzes its structure, distills key ideas, and then goes outside the paper to demonstrate an ethnography of infrastructure within a hobby. The video concludes with critical reflections and what makes this paper great. Let's go. Susan Lee Starr was an American scholar and social scientist. She obtained a PhD in sociology from the University of California, San Francisco in 1983. Her doctoral dissertation analyzed the development of theories of the brain and mind in late 19th century British neuroscience. While at the University of California, San Francisco, Starr was mentored by Anselm Strauss and Howard Becker, two of the most famous sociologists of the past century. Looking across her most cited publications, we can see Starr's major contributions. There is the idea of boundary object, that is, the informational entities that allow different groups to collaborate on a common task, and, with partner Jeff Boker, an analysis of classification systems. Starr developed the concept of infrastructure, which is an always relational part of human organization, the things that are substrate to events and movements. The Ethnography of Infrastructure, her second most cited publication, is about the challenges and opportunities of studying infrastructure. We'll go deeper into this paper shortly. In her own words, Starr expressed her lifelong motivating questions as, how does good technology connect to changing oneself? And how does bad technology connect with the larger structure of the world? In 2007, she wrote, I have been trying for about the last 20 years to link the following three dimensions, lived experience, technologies, and silences. In this statement, Starr uses the word silences poetically, not referring to an absence of sound, but as an instance of something being rendered missing or being silenced. While Starr was seen as a scholar based in science and technology studies, her ideas had great appeal, relevance, and range. This pie chart, generated by the database Scopus, shows her publications by topic. It's kaleidoscopic. These are the sundry disciplines that cite Starr's work. She had a colorful patchwork of readers. Though a scholar of classification systems, she seems to escape classification. Susan Lee Starr died unexpectedly in her sleep of unknown causes on March 24, 2010, at age 55. Outpourings of shock and grief followed. Colleagues, scholars, and students memorialized Starr as a brilliant and original thinker, one of the leading scholars of our time, a boundary spanner, and a great teacher, mentor, and friend. In the 1990s, social scientists from different disciplines were struggling to adapt research methods used in the study of real-world field sites to the study of technologically enabled online or digital field sites. To that end, the journal American Behavioral Scientist published an issue devoted to analyzing virtual societies, new directions in methodology. The collection addressed the associated methodological challenges, such as finding boundaries and connections between online and offline spaces, the nature of real versus virtual identities, embodiment and geography in computer-mediated worlds, the complex layering of technological artifacts, and incorporating the user into the research process. Starr's paper speaks to many of these themes and appears first in the collection. Now, 25 years since publication, we can see how the eight featured articles were referenced by later authors. Starr's paper, with more than 2,000 citations, by far had an outsized impact. Let's look at it closely now. At 13 pages of text and two of notes and references, this is not a long article. After its title, byline, and abstract, there are two quotations. The first short statement by Louis L. Bucchiarelli from his book about the engineering process echoes Starr's argument. It defines infrastructure as a dense interwoven fabric that is dynamic, thoroughly ecological, and fragile. The second quotation comes from the 1817 poem Ozymandias by the British Romantic poet Percy Bush Shelley. Tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things. Shelley's poem is about the rise and fall of civilizations and the rulers who attempt 
to amplify and extend their influence in symbolic artifacts. A complex poem, the snippet invoked by Star could be interpreted in many ways. For me, a reader is alerted that the best and worst qualities of humanity are built into the material world. Then, the main text launches with a joke. This article is, in a way, a call to the study of boring things, because many aspects of infrastructure are singularly unexciting. And nearby, she dedicates the paper to other members of the Society of People Interested in Boring Things. This joke is a celebrated element of the paper. I'll return to it later in my critique. Then, there are two examples of infrastructure, the international classification of diseases and an old-fashioned print phone book. We would not likely read either for entertainment, nor have these reference sources captured the imagination of social scientists. Compared to tropes like talk, community, and identity, information artifacts such as these are the forgotten, the background, the frozen in place. But Starr asserts that classification systems and phone books, both instances of infrastructure, reflect social realities and should be studied. After all, the content and organization of a phone book says much about a community and its values. She goes further that even the building blocks of technologies, its plugs, settings, sizes, and other profoundly mundane aspects need analytical attention. Starr invokes wise words of her mentor, the sociologist Anselm Strauss, who said, study the unstudied. Bringing such research objects into focus requires a different perspective what STARS collaborator Jeff Bowker calls an infrastructural inversion. With the reader's curiosity now piqued about studying infrastructure, the section Defining Infrastructure contains the most systematic exposition of the paper. STAR outlines nine properties or dimensions of infrastructure, namely embeddedness. Infrastructure is sunk into the inside of other structures, social arrangements, and technologies. Infrastructure also has transparency and invisibly supports other tasks. Central to infrastructure is its reach or scope. It extends spatially or temporally beyond any single event or one-site practice. And it is learned as a part of membership. Newcomers sometimes struggle, but eventually ascend a learning curve. Infrastructure has links with conventions of practice. Star provides an example of the standard QWERTY computer keyboard, which was inherited from the typewriter keyboard. Further, infrastructure embodies standards. Starr is a sociologist of science and points out how scientific information systems enact existing standards, such as the naming protocols for genetic strains. Infrastructure is also built on an installed base. It does not appear out of the blue. Instead, it wrestles with the inertia of the installed base and inherits strengths and limitations from that base. This property is seen in new information systems that are designed for backwards compatibility. Infrastructure becomes visible upon breakdown. Here, Star invokes the all-too-familiar experience in an organization of vital infrastructure being down. At that frustrating point, most of us suddenly see our reliance upon infrastructure. Finally, infrastructure is fixed in modular increments, not all at once or globally. Being big, layered, and complex means that change takes time and negotiation. She writes that there is no magic wand to be waved over the development effort of infrastructure. Next up is infrastructure and methods. Star lists traditional ethnographic research methods that can be used to study infrastructure, with examples and reflections from her own research. The ethnography of infrastructure may entail historical and literary analysis. For example, in her study of classification systems, Star conducted archival research on death certificates, old newspapers, and law books. Ethnographers of infrastructure may do semi-structured interviews and observations. She did both with nurses who were striving to develop categories of their own work. Star names systems analysis and usability studies as tools for the ethnography of infrastructure. Here, she recalls the early history in the 1980s of ethnographers and computer scientists working with systems users to create better designs, a collaborative formula that is now common. She sees transaction logs, as relatives of ethnographic field notes, though they are harder to analyze satisfactorily due to their volume. This marks the end of the first and longest section of the article. The outline of infrastructure's properties and research methods toolkit are probably the most accessible and popular contributions of the paper. What remains includes many additional methodological insights. These display star sensitivity to the power inequalities inherent to infrastructure. 
She cautions that infrastructure often represents a simplified master narrative while resisting diversity and silencing others. As when medical forms assume a binary definition of gender, though in actuality, there is a multiplicity. Star reports that infrastructure may empower some actors, such as scientists, while diminishing crucial contributions of others, such as secretaries. The paper closes with a call to action for justice when creating infrastructure. She proposes more interdisciplinary and ethnographic research on infrastructure, work which is a terrifying and delightful challenge of the information age. I'll go beyond Star's paper now to demonstrate an ethnography of infrastructure. Did you know that a list is infrastructure? Lists can shape experience, even within leisure, such as in the hobby of astronomy. For this hobby, people become familiar with the night sky and its celestial objects. To that end, many use the Messier list. In the mid-1700s, French astronomer Charles Messier was a comet hunter. He began keeping a list of things he saw that were not comets. Note a comet. A comet. Messier documented more than 100 non-comets, such as galaxies and star clusters, which he published in 1784. Since then, Messier's list has been an important point of reference for astronomers and their hobby counterparts. It is infrastructure because it is learned as a part of membership. Note a comet. Newcomers are encouraged to find all the objects on Messier's list. Not a comet. Upon completion, yeah. They receive a certificate and a lapel pin. The Messier list has reach and scope. It endures temporally across time and geographically across the globe. Here it is in Arabic. And the list upholds conventions of practice. Observing Messier objects must conform to the rules. Namely, you cannot use an auto-finding telescope. A more thorough ethnography of infrastructure might interview astronomy hobbyists as they work through the list, or even conduct participant observation at a Messier Marathon, which is an overnight event of seeing every item on the list. Susan Lee Starr reminds us of justice and asks who or what is silenced. The Messier list was generated from the Northern Hemisphere and neglects the night sky of the Southern perspective. It also privileges science and technology over indigenous and mythical cosmologies. Next, in an appreciative spirit, here are three of my own critical reflections on the paper. First, on the one hand, Starr's opening joke that infrastructure can be singularly unexciting and boring is playful and memorable. On the other hand, I don't think infrastructure is boring at all, and I regret that this idea has been fortified in the literature. Second, Starr brings the elusive concept of infrastructure into focus, especially when delineating its nine dimensions. But I still want more precision as to what qualifies as infrastructure in the form of types or instances. For example, infrastructure can be software, hardware, social, not a commit, and documentary. I wish Star had proposed categories or an organized set of examples. Finally, I find the paper's first half to be well-paced and right-sized, but the second half more compressed, and there's a shortage of disciplinary points of reference. It appears that Star recognized these shortcomings. She extended the ethnography of infrastructure in the much longer 2002 paper, Infrastructure and Ethnographic Practice, Working on the Fringes. Comparing the two papers side by side, we can see additional helpful concepts and disciplinary context. Thanks, Professor Starr. And now, what makes this paper great? Susan Lee Starr's The Ethnography of Infrastructure is beautifully written, playful and accessible, with poetic touches and memorable examples. It is authored in a spacious, accessible and inclusive style that has rightly earned wide appeal. The paper's most innovative contribution is the concept of infrastructure. Starr forever sensitizes us to this part of human organization and the things that are substrate to events and movements. The nine properties and research methods toolkit set up many future lines of research. Yeah. Importantly, Starr extends her sociological, methodological acumen to new online domains and virtual realities. Her suggestions are holistic, ethical, compassionate, and activist. I am a devoted information scientist, but Starr's paper leaves me wondering if I am a scientist of infrastructure. Thanks for watching an episode of What Makes This Paper Great. Please like, share, and comment upon this video, and subscribe to InVideos to learn more yeah. about information science. 
à Comet.